Hey, I am Mustafa Sharif. Thank you for listening to Urbanistica podcast. I was looking forward to this episode. It's very interesting topic. The topic that I was interested since the the high school and then the, in my master. And also now when we talk about smart city, it's about vertical farming. So I have the pleasure to welcome the master of vertical farming, Sefer Musavi. Hey, Sefer. Thank you for the invitation, Mustafa. It's so great to be here with you today. How are you doing? Uh, pretty good. I guess this is a time that the world is a bit upside down, but I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> yes, and thank you so much for giving your time and soon your knowledge and experience to inspire us in this topic. Sure thing. That's a pleasure. Safir, how would you like to introduce yourself? The mic is yours now. <laughs> okay, that's, uh, yeah, all right. No, I like to see myself as an enthusiast when it comes to questions in relations to, to future and thinking outside the box and building some, uh, you know, sustainable solutions for the future of human beings. So that's something that I'm interested so, in. So you're passionate about finding solutions for, better, for a better future? Absolutely. I mean, I'm thinking a lot about uh, different gap societies and how you could fill up these gaps between, uh, you know, people in different societies. So that's one of the basic passions that I've got. Uh, you know, it's a very difficult one and sometimes it sounds like a cliche, but, uh, you know, you could always be a dreamer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now you're, you're the head of innovation, right? Yes. And how is it going? What do you do like a daily basis? And your job um it's going pretty good i'm working in a very young industry so there is a lot of room for improvement um as you know i'm working with urban agriculture and uh, vertical farming which is a kind of new industry which is becoming more and more viable and visible in city environments and this environment is being uplifted to a new level of a smartness and that gives me as a um innovation expert basically a lot of room for improvement and doing a lot of new things a lot of experimental things and also concrete things that could um, you know shape the future of food production so that's that's pretty cool <laughs> yes yeah i'm also looking forward to talk more about it to start with like if we look back at the history how did it start why why did human wanted a vertical farm why we just didn't continue with the normal farming <laughs> Sure, I guess I could give you like three different um, aspects on that one. There are different kind of like, you know, stories behind that that people tend to say. The people who don't like it call it that that's a spin-off of growing uh, marijuana in that industry. <laughs> <laughs> Some other people talk about like, you know, productivity and a very efficient uh, footprint based on area. So if you want to do farming in a city, you basically need to do that in a more dense environment so it becomes uh, viable. I like to see that more or less connected to the journey of Apollo 11 to the, to the moon. That's my kind of a story because I think as soon as Neil Armstrong and the other people uh, landed on moon, we started to think about if we need to grow food in a controlled environment in different planets. And then obviously you need to have the most resource efficient setting for producing food. So I, I like to see that as in a space technology. Wow, very interesting. Tell me how, how does it work actually, if you just explain to us, because we know, okay, vertical farming, something grows mm -hmm. vertically. But from yeah. what I understand that there are so many different techniques to, to grow the different plants. Absolutely, absolutely. No, you could see that like that. I mean, vertical farming is a subcategory of controlled environment agriculture. And controlled environment agriculture is basically manipulating the situation for an optimal growth system. So if you basically thought, talked about agriculture, I mean, agriculture is not a natural uh, process basically because we are supposed to receive our food from different ecosystem services from the nature but then we started farming. So we started manipulating the situation, like preparing the land and like irrigating and likes of those. And then it continued, um, you know, being upgraded till the 60s, 70s, when we started with greenhouses. And then now we are talking about the, the context of, you know, the absolute climate that you yeah. could have a hundred percent control over the environment and the optimal growth system for the plants. 
So if you have that in combination with growing in different layers in a more space effective and efficient system, then you're talking about smart urban farming in a vertical setting. Mm. Wonderful. And how does it work? Like the system? Um, basically, it works like that. You need to meet all the demands of a plant and provide a plant with the optimal growth setting, which more or less are six, seven different parameters that you have. So you have different parameters like you know, temperature, humidity, water and irrigation, different nutrition, the amount of light that a plant needs, the amount of CO2 that you need for photosynthesis and such different parameters. And these factors also are the limitation factors for the growth of a plant as well. So if you have uh, a very fertile soil and you have good seeds in it and, you know, you have a very good temperature and so on, but you don't water it, it doesn't grow. Uh, the, context, the context of control environment agriculture is balancing all of those different parameters in an optimal setting, that all of them are met in an absolute setting or in an optimal setting that just makes sense based on the level of catalyzation of the growth that you could do for the system. So it's more or less like providing a, a plant with whatever that it needs. Yeah, but it, it means that you need to do a lot of research and know exactly how the, all these parameters, uh, exactly. right? I mean, Right, exactly. I mean, this is where the data science comes to the picture and makes this industry a bit more smarter. And this is the new part that is coming to the picture when you have the IoT infrastructure that would enable you to actually sense those and monitor those and optimize those. And then by help of different, you know, te technologies like machine learning, then you could create algorithms that connects your input and output together. So it's all about closing the data loop for finding the, you know, the perfect recipe for the plant growth. Yeah. Are we talking about every single plant or there are specific plants that we can grow on? You could, you could basically grow whatever plant indoor if you want to do that vertically or not. I mean, obviously you can't have, you can and can't have like a vertical system that you have, like for example, banana plants in a vertical system because it doesn't make sense or you could actually build a structure that supports it. Uh, the thing is, uh, the things that we are producing at the moment in our facilities is more or less the leafy greens and the herbs which are 100% edible biomass. But when you're talking about like preparing the situation for a plant that doesn't give you the 100% edible biomass like the tree, because then it takes a couple of years before you get the fruit or the fruit that yeah. you're getting is not that much of biomass that is produced by your resources, then it doesn't become very much sustainable and economically viable. So that's why most of the vertical farming facilities, they focus on leafy greens, like, you know, different types of salads, kales, pak choy, and different types of herbs like basil, you know, uh, you know, things like that. Yeah. Yeah. And how much are we talking about, like in terms of area, vertical area and um, production? Okay. So basically, I mean, there is a concept that is called vertical farming ratio. And the ratio is the amount of layers or the kind of, you know, um, the land that you create basically by putting these vertical uh, uh, vertical layers and stack them on top of each other. So you create growable area in an area that doesn't exist. So you have a minimal footprint and then you could grow in different layers. So one uh, enabler, which is exponential, is the technology that you're using for your vertical farming that could be different from like, you know, two layers to as many as layers as possible. And the other thing is like how optimized of a climate you have for growing your plants, but mostly for one square meters of um, global area that you create, uh, the numbers differ from like something between 10 to 20 kilos for different herbs or specific ones to somewhat around 150 to 200 kilos per year of production of leafy greens like kale, for example, yeah. based on the different systems that you're you're using. Well, where do you have these layers? I imagine that you need a really specific room with different machines that take care of all the parameters you mentioned. Absolutely. So, I mean, we have a farm that is under operation in Stockholm. And 
if you know the, the famous Dawkins Nehetter Tower, which is the uh, old newspaper tower, which used to be one of the tallest uh, buildings of the Stockholm, actually is one of the top fives of the Stockholm yet, and was the, the, the highest one during the 60s and 70s, we have a farm under that tower that is under operation. The area is more or less around 500 square meters that um, we have, and then we created the farm there. So we have a controlled climate, basically, and we grow food vertically down there. The technology that we use there based on the amount of limited ceiling that we have gives us a ratio around like two to three. Um, and that technology enables us to pr produce like somewhat around 25 tons of food per year in a small wow. uh, you know, cellar facility like that per year. Yeah, wow, that's uh, so much, right? What? That's pretty much a lot because, I mean, the numbers for consumption of leafy greens and, uh, you know, herbs are not that high. So if you talk about, uh, you know, uh, herbs like basil, you know, coriander, parsley and likes of those, one Stockholmer doesn't uh, consume more than a, a couple of grams per day based on the, the average numbers that are coming from you know, like, uh, likes of the authorities like Jörg Buxverket and Livsmedels Verket, for example. Uh, and when it comes to leafy greens, you have an average around 40 grams. So when you talk about 25 tons, you're actually talking yeah. about the consumption of, you know, meeting that up to 3 to 4% of whatever herb that is used in a Stockholm per year. So mm -hmm. by having 30, 40 facilities like that, you could make a Stockholm totally self-sufficient in that sense. Wow. And how do you how do you sell what you produce? Like, uh... um, basically, we are selling that in in different formats. So we have um, different product that becomes packaged and sold to to consumers uh, through retailers. Um, our produce comes as under the title of Estadsbundens or the Urban Farmers Produce that we are selling at different Ica, Coop, and you know hemp shop stores. Uh, and then we, we have collaborations with different restaurants and the catering actors as well, especially the famous chefs that are focused on, uh, you know, sustainable food, like so Paul Svensson, Tarek Taylor, and likes of those people that we have collaboration with. And those people receive them without any packaging. So they receive the day's harvest yeah. and they, they uh, come up with different plans with that food as it comes. So it's more or less like a seasonal food that is available for them, like, you know, during the whole year. Wow. And then you're also building two different new technologies that one of them is going to enable us to sell directly to the to the end users by subscription plans, maybe. So you could actually like come up in contact with people. And we are also using some sort of, uh, you know, online uh, shop settings like uh, PicSmart, for example, that you could buy or produce uh, in Stockholm. And then the new thing that we are developing is providing retailers, entrepreneurs, and restaurants with a unit that we call that farming as a service. Okay. So you could actually enable any entrepreneur to grow leafy greens and herbs indoor without having any knowledge because we could control them remotely for them. Uh, okay, so they just provide you the space and you take care of exactly. everything. Exactly. Right. So they basically, I mean, lease one of those units from us and we put it in their facilities based on the demand and the space that they have. So we come up with a plan and then uh, basically they pay as they go. So it's a plug and play kind of unit and it's controlled by us and we send everything that they need for growing food indoor to them. So they don't need to have any knowledge or anything. They just need to give us the consumption data and we produce the food for them by this cloud services that we are developing at the moment. Well, tell tell me about the prices, uh, like from the thing that you sell. Is it cheaper or more expensive than the it's average total, price? It's, it's totally compatible with the other, like you know, unsustainable yeah. uh, <laughs> alternatives that are available in the market. Uh, at the moment, the the farm facility, I mean, it goes like in hundred percent capacity because we have a lot of problem with these global chains that are broken at the moment. So the food in being imported from Spain, Italy, and countries like that, which we at the moment don't really want to have as well, gives us an upper hand to show that how a resilient food system is important. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, I mean, uh, the price are totally compatible because we don't have that many middle hands in our value chain. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of that. But if you enable
enable a retailer or an entrepreneur even to be the producer and the seller, then the margins could go up to two times because still like the biggest overhead is the retailer for, uh, for our sector. And how much does it cost for the service you give to the restaurants? Like how, um, how do you, the units? We have the different uh, capacities that you get some amount of different like units or pots per day of different plants, which differ from like 400 to like just go up. So you receive like 400 like pots of plants that you basically want to have from different heads of salads or like, you know, different herbs like, you know, basil and parsley, for example. And those units start like at a leasing price around 40,000 to 80,000 and then above, depending on if you want to have like a uh, big unit. And the margins are at least like with a 100%, uh, you know, win. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. How does it taste? Do you, do you get any feedback about the taste of the? Absolutely. Like, uh, I mean, there are two different aspects to to taste. Uh, one of them is what is the effect of different elements that you provide for the plant and this optimal setting that you uh, basically prepare for a plant to grow in, that has an impact on intensity uh, of the taste as well. And then the other thing is like how you could adjust the taste based on what your consumers basically want to receive from you. Because in some countries, for example, you like your basil to be a bit sweet. In yeah. some other countries, you want your basil to be a bit peppery, for example. And these are the different parameters that you could actually tweak and adjust in different markets based on the amount of nutrients, temperature, humidity, water that you make available for your plant in different phases. So this is uh, kind of like the amazing part about controlled environment farming. So when you talk about different produce that, oh, the best basil of the world is basil Genovese that creates the pesto Genovese because Genova has the best setting for creating a basil plant, but that you could mimic. Or when you talk about like Swedish strawberries, why a Swedish strawberry tastes so good? It's because, I mean, you have long days and you have very like chilly nights. So the plant basically gets a lot of sunlight during the day and produce a lot of sugar by photosynthesis, but during the night it falls asleep. So it doesn't have the ability to create a lot of biomass. So it yeah. you know, stays small, but it gets really sweet. And these are things that you could mimic in our system. Wow, that's super smart, no? Really smart. It's, <laughs> it's all about data controlling, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It's very much like in, in connection with like how you should tweak your, your data and your resources your team what are the different disciplines in your team that mm -hmm. manage this system at the moment i mean we have a team that is consisting of more or less 10 to 15 people depending on the executive executive people working with us and the sales team and the business developers that we have but the main principles that we have at the moment is the people working like first with uh you know horticulture aspect of growing food and the vertical farmers and the overall system supporting the farm and the infrastructure behind the farm. So we have a chief technologist, we have head growers, and then we have vertical farmers. These are people who work in the operations, uh, which are led by the chief operations officer and the CEO. And then we have people who work with the data structure as our data scientist, chief data officer, and me, which is the head of innovation and also responsible for our sustainable technology development, which takes care of our uh, infrastructure integration because our farm is in symbiosis with our host facility. And then we have people who work with market and business development at the management level as well to, to the field by selling our produce. So it's different departments taking care of different uh, principles, basically. Yeah. What, a, what a great team. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's really uh, is, cool. is, uh, is the Sweden your only market now? At the moment, we are focused in Sweden. I mean, I'm coming from a background that I have worked with vert vertical farming innovation pioneer around, we, I started there around seven years ago. And, you know, time in, flies. In Sweden. I think about in Sweden. I mean, yeah. that's how I actually like became interested in that because I was looking for projects that could save the future of this planet and vertical farming was one of the one of the innovations on my list and then okay. i found the company in, in a stockholm that was working as an innovation pioneer with vertical farming and i kind of created a job for myself uh, up there 
So <laughs> that's a longer story. So I'm not going to bore you with that. But um, because I had a uh, career change um, behind of me, like before just changing to that role and starting as a chief sustainability officer for that company at the time. But then that company had really like gigantic visions of feeding the planet and using urban agriculture as really high level and extending its market, especially to Far East when you have the dense cities. And I've seen that innovation company basically going bankrupt and losing its niche. Even if the concept was strong, the financing behind the company was strong, and there was like a very strong patent portfolio that had a value of 220 million euros behind it. But right. innovation, I mean, innovation is like that. When you start with an innovation that doesn't have the technical readiness level and the infrastructure maturity, you need to kind of like, you know, extend these two things and try to just plug them into each other. And if you, have, if you don't have the muscles for that, then you lose your niche. You need to have the financing, you need to have the infrastructure building capacity and so on. Just think about like, for example, e-cars as an example for an industry, like why Tesla succeeded with, um, with this innovation and not nobody else? Because I mean, the, the e-car innovation existed for at least 50 years before Tesla started like making it uh, re being realized. Or if you talk about like infrastructure readiness when it comes to different streaming systems like Netflix, why Netflix succeeded and not many other ones like Pixar or Sony before that, because, because I mean, they were bigger than Netflix when they started. So, I mean, and then we uh, created this startup that I'm a partner, one of the founding partners of uh, around a year ago. So after the other company uh, was basically closed down his business and we started with this smaller initiative that is focused at the moment on the Swedish market because we wanted to create a minimum viable version of the innovation that is easy to realize yeah. and then make it feasible to basically go and scale it up when you have the proof of concept instead of creating a concept that needs a lot of financial support for building the proof of concept yeah so so basically you're doing it step by step now from a exactly. Swedish market it, it, then you scale it up then you could scale it up when you have the financial muscle and basically you have the proof of concept in your hand now we have the proof of concept for farming in our environment and now we're creating the, the proof of concept for farming as a service so this is our wow. strategy to go up like that very interesting i imagine that you need to deal with a lot of different policies here in sweden right sure i mean the the easiest policies that you could start talking about is like why when you have a farming unit that doesn't use any chemicals it doesn't spray anything no herbicide no pesticides and you can't basically label it as organic for example <laughs> because the authorities ask you to grow in soil. But I mean, should I import a lot of soil into the city and then send it to consumers with like 15 grams of leafy greens that they could like just, you know, <laughs> uh, basically pick the basil and throw away the soil? Obviously not. Yeah, but I mean, then you can't be labeled as organic. So there are many kind of policies that make it very difficult. And then there are some other ones that comes to work environment regulations, for example, when it comes to different layers of vertical farming, but if you're going to have bigger facilities that, for example, if, if a reaper man is coming to your facility, they shouldn't uh, crouch basically to walk into the farm. So they should walk. And if okay. you want to do that, then you can't have like five layers into human height. So you need to create only two heights. <laughs> so these are many, many regulations like that that need to be basically adjusted in the future if this industry is going to go like easier. But how, how do you deal with it? How do you walk um, around? Basically, I mean, sometimes it's like that. Sometimes you try to just, you know, cope and adjust and like, you know, convince people. Sometimes you just go around that. So organic for us more or less was like, we, we shouldn't even go with a trend that already is a bit like old fashioned. So let's go beyond it. We shouldn't like be trying to just hang out with that. I mean, it was an avant-garde movement after the industrialization, maybe in the 80s, 90s, even in the early 2000s, but not anymore. So for me, like local produce produced in a resource efficient system with a minimized base system is more viable than ecological food or like, you know, organically certified food that comes from other continents to us. And so is it for many other people living in, in Sweden at the moment by supporting the, the local producers, for example. 
and then you, you shouldn't you shouldn't basically like do a piggybacking on them you should create your own thing and you should stand behind it and you know just make people realize and educate your consumers to change their behavior exactly but this is actually a kind of two faces from like uh, about the policy because on one face we say ah oh, we want to be climate friendly and be positive mm -hmm. and yeah. less import of food and so on and other from the other face we just make it so difficult to make it a local produced food i mean this this is a dilemma i mean this is something that needs to be addressed at a very political level because if sweden is talking about a food security strategy that sweden actually has because we're importing more or less like 60 percent of the food consumed in sweden which is a very risky thing and now we, we realize with a crisis like the crisis that we have with the with the covid virus and we realize like oh we are so dependent on the food being imported yeah. to our country and the priciness of, of the produce and the scarcity of the produce at the moment. So these things like that needs to be actually like addressed as, as a high strategic level and then basically like enable the different SMEs and the innovation parties working with that through the different innovation funds and the business support and likes of those that could enable Sweden to become more self-sufficient by use of these technologies. Obviously, this is not the only produce that is produced in systems like that that could make us uh, food secure. So that's one aspect that we need to bring to consideration. But food industry is like that. There is no single silver bullet for food industry. Mm. You need to have different pieces of puzzles that come together. You need to minimize your food waste. You need to have better consumption trends. You need to produce your fresh produce closer to your consumers. Maybe you should focus on less use of chemicals and fertilizers when it comes to traditional and conventional farming, less animal produce, and many other aspects like that when it comes to animal rights. The future food that has a lot of, you know, hinders as well when, when it comes to use of new products like algae, insects, you know, many, many different produce that have a lot of hinders as well. So it needs to have an umbrella strategy, uh, basically uh, top down. Yeah, and it's not only addressing the vertical farming, but looking through the whole system. Exactly. Production and consumption. Yeah, because I mean, as many uh, known scientists like Bjorn Rockström says all the time, if you're going to solve the, the climate crisis, we need to solve the, the food crisis because 30% of our carbon footprint comes from the food industry and the processing and the other processes connected and associated with food chain. So if we don't uh, solve it, we can't like, you know, solve the, the climate issue. But the thing about the, the food chain is it's so global that you can't break it down because it's basically yes. as in a spin-off of the uh, old, uh, you know, trade agreements that we have from the, from the 60s, 70s. Mm. But how, how do you change the mindset mm -hmm. so people uh, can accept? Are, are you talking about people? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, I could give you an example, like, you know, around seven years ago, when you talked about vertical farming and, you know, food being grown indoor in a mimic nature uh, climate, a lot of people talked about unnaturality of that that this food is not natural it's not basically exposed to the to the daylight i don't think if it smells good if it tastes good it sounds fake you know things like that <laughs> but when you when you start to have more and more initiatives that work with this kind of producers and you explain it for people and you try to just you know clarify that how these different environments could be created and what's the difference between sunlight and the 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 kind of light that you could mimic indoor by help of this new LEDs that are produced at the moment. And what's different aspects of sustainability when it comes to producing food closer to the consumers or like on the other side of the world, then people start to understand it and people are becoming interested in technologies that enable you. But in the very beginning, when you have the first kind of like close contact with these technologies and the interfaces, you need to break the ice. Yes. People are always scared of something that they don't know. Of course. I mean, the unknown is always scary. And, you, you know, being scared is not a very good motive. So, I mean, fear creates gap. But yeah. the more light that you shed on something dark, the more known it becomes to people. Yeah. And I also thinking that you have a, also 
a big responsibility to show to the world and to the citizen, like in, for instance, Stockholm, that how does it work and you invite them to see it. It's actually work and it gives a lot of values to the, to the city as a, a local produced food, but also in a healthy, sustainable way. Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is this is a thing that at corporate level you could try to address, but then obviously you need a lot of support from the different bodies of a city and different actors also, like being af- active in that one that we also get. I mean, we have a lot of good collaboration with different academic partners from different like research institutes and universities, and you see more and more people who are becoming interested in this topic, and then you understand that it becomes more and more multidisciplinary also. Like not only people interested in agriculture, but people interested in energy solutions, in you know creating like nutrition from wastewater, waste management, and then people from the data sector and people coming from like the IoT sector, and like it's it's so interesting to see like how you could create it from different networks that exposes you out there, and people more and more reach out to you to talk to you and learn about things that you're doing. Yes, it's very interesting. It's also especially for me working with architecture and urban planning. Now I'm coming to this hub and wanted to ask you, can we have these units in a normal room, like uh, let's say a co-working space or in school? Can, are, are we able? I mean, there are two different kind of like units that people have started to to develop. I mean, you could you could have like one of these smaller units that are totally like in an open space, trying to just you know create a better optimal system for growth of foods like the green walls for example that you see a lot of different spaces but those are not that much focused on growing a lot of food this is more about like creation of green space and then some other companies they focused on some sort of refrigerator like units that you could put in different places and you could grow food in them this is a bit like too much focused on only producing food and okay. doesn't have that much of exposure for people to experience things but obviously, if you create like an isolated, uh, basically environment by having glass around an isolated environment, you could give them both visibility and also the availability of this controlled environment for production of uh, you know optimized food. Wow. So it's doable. Yeah, it's doable. And do you, do you think in the future that the people can have it, not like only restaurants or entrepreneurs, like normal people at their home? Obviously, I mean, these smaller units that are becoming more and more available, they're not that much sustainable yet because the, the units are quite energy intensive based on the energy used for the ALEDs. If you don't integrate it into any infrastructure to use the surplus heat for something else. So that's one thing that, for example, we are doing by creating the symbiosis, but it gives you the possibility of growing food indoor then you don't have the climate outside so it's dark it's cold but you grow the food indoor because you you have a very good situation down there so yes it's becoming more and more available yeah but i mean one thing that is important for us i mean this is like one of the things that we we call we just called it like this farming as a service units we thought like it could be a neighbor to neighbor enabler factor because not everybody's interested in growing their own food as not everybody is interested to, to do the other kind of like chores for themselves and produce the other produce. But if you are an entrepreneur which is interested in one of those, then you could get one of those in a franchise set and then you try to enable your uh, neighbors to, for receiving this kind of like locally produced plants and then you could have like good margins of uh, you doing good business as well. Yeah, so it's also a way of creating communities. Exactly, exactly. So. I mean, urban food production is one of the enablers for creating like this local, sustainable, more bounded communities around like the concept of food. Mm. And as a head of innovation, how much do you need to deal with the research every day? Because I believe this your 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 job is all about like develop developing every single detail, right? No, I was actually like nagging to our CEO yesterday that I'm feeling myself like becoming more and more ahead of R&D rather than ahead of innovation because it's like too much kind of like, you know, theoretical research that you're doing at the moment as well. But I mean, of course, like when you do this kind of like basic research, then you could make it to applicable research and that becomes a part of basics for innovation. So you can't always like think outside the box. You need to also like concretely create things. 
but then you need a lot of uh, resources in or like in money, time, and material, right? Uh, absolutely. To from theory um, to exactly, and this is like one of the challenges that we have at our day to day, like you know, operations at uh, as we are coming from a startup, and you don't have that much of like you know staff and money and time. So one of the enablers for us is like inviting uh, thesis students to work with us, inviting different researchers from different principles to work with us and seek like different, uh, you know, grants and funded projects, for example, from European level to national level around the research area that would also give us some sort of a spin-off. So this is kind of like creation of this network that could make you uh, basically empowered and enabled to get access to this kind of theoretical research, research output that these researchers do and get the foundation for growing the things that you need as a head of innovation in your work. Yeah, yeah. but do, do you feel that you're, you're alone and not so many people supporting your idea and you need to fight a lot to, to prove that this is working? How, how, what is your, what's um, your feeling? I mean, basically, it's a lot of, of course, like you sometimes you feel like um, it could have been easier if the mindset was a bit different, especially when it comes like to the available funding for those first waivers working with these innovations. Because working as a first waiver is really difficult. Working with a proof of concept and then you have like already engaged customers is way easier. So those people who create an industry, they always suffer the most and they win the least. So th these are like things that you always wish that you you had some better uh, kind of like, you know, setting to do that. But the challenges that you see ahead of you gives you like so much satisfaction in being able to win. So yeah. when we, for example, I mean, we started this company around a year ago and then we did a round of investment, uh, basically like exactly like before the end of the year and we kept it just open for a couple of months and we put a price tag on the company and we were able to get the investment that we wanted from the different people who were like you know serial entrepreneurs or people who did an exit on different like digital solutions and even like people who only invest in normal risk capital mainstream uh, financing systems and then you get some sort of like confirmation from the system that shit we're doing it yeah so this always feels good this always feels good of course like if it was easier it would have been like much more smooth but winning this hinders and like going uphill and then looking back and say like i came all the way yeah feels yeah. really good yeah i made it yeah, of course. And I mean, especially if you do that, like with, with a team of people who always support each other and you, you feel like, I mean, we, we have a winner team. So these are these are like good feelings that you, you get also like satisfaction from your work. True. Uh, also, startups life is a bit difficult and it's a lot of teamwork Super and mood and energy. Agility and many, many different factors like that. I mean, I, I've worked in a startup environment for more or less seven years now, and sometimes I feel like I'm so tired that I want to go back to corporate <laughs> life. But I mean, sometimes when you think about the corporate life, then you think about, I'm about I mean, it's going to suffocate you as well because you, then you don't have the agility because yeah. you're going to yeah. have like a lot of like layers. So, of course, you're standing on the shoulders, shoulders of a giant. But the giants sometimes control you as well. But as in a startup, you could change direction like every day. So the next morning, if your strategy changes, you run to right, right or left. You don't have that much of like overhead and like a yeah. uh, very heavy uh, infrastructure of a corporate organization above you. Sometimes you miss that. Sometimes you uh, that you need to be like the IT manager, the HR manager, you know, everything like yourself. And sometimes you don't miss it. So it's it's a dilemma as well. Yeah. It's and also, it's very interesting uh, entrepreneurship advice is now getting from you. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. How do you imagine the, the future city, the smart city? Because you are one of the steps that take us to the smart city, but as a general course, image. No, I mean, like one thing is like introducing new functions, like the things that we are doing at the moment. And then a couple of years ago or a few years ago, I was outsourced a lot to, to a smart city projects with the, with the previous company that I was working with. And I had uh, a privilege of working with a lot of, you know, top-notch consultancy companies on 
different smart city projects, and I worked with uh, many different successful city cases when it comes to smart city as an expert, and that was really enjoyable. But I mean, a smart city is a very broad concept, and it could be translated and interpreted in many different ways as well. So it very much depends, like, what do you mean by a smart city? For me, a smart city is a city management vision. And then your vision could be sustainability, happiness of the people, it could be connectivity, it could be use of artificial intelligence. So based on whatever that you're talking about, then you could define your smart city as strategy. So it's very dif different like from case to case. So how do you define a smart city? What aspect you're gonna choose? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if I was a city mayor and you were my consultants who wanted to help me draw my smart city map, I would have told you that I want to be focused on application of smart and sustainable technologies for making the, the life of the people more easy and make them happier and also like create the settings for attraction of investment. So this would have been like the things that I would have told you. Yeah. But uh, many different cities also focus on these aspects when it comes to those. For example, if you look at the strategy of a smart city for Stockholm, it's more or less about like investments and it's about connectivity that enables you to lower down your carbon footprint and use of resources, for example. But it's not that much focused on walkability, for example, or if you're talking about people having fun, for example, Barcelona is all about that. When you talk about like a smart city strategy of Barcelona, it's about the hardware infrastructure that is managed by the city. And at the very people level, you talk about like happiness, walkability, and you know, a city that should be fun. Yeah. When you focus on a city like Singapore, for example, then it's all about connectivity and having a solid monitoring system for all the activities happening in your city to, to smartly manage your city at a very top-down level so it's very very different when you talk about amsterdam for example it's talking about like how you enable the private entities and the people as entrepreneurs and innovators to to solve the issues of the city for them so it's it's really 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 different from case to case yes and uh, what i suggest to you now is that you leave your startup and just join the urban planning and policy making <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this this could have been like one of one of the uh, changes that could have come to me. I mean, when as I told you, like one year ago, I I started and I started with a great team of people, and before that, I was thinking about should I go to the political scene? Should I work with a think tank? Should I go and work with with the city councils, for example? Should I work with consultancy companies, like more solidly? on a smart city cases, but still I decided to, to stay an entrepreneur and go with a startup working with vertical farming, but maybe in the future. <laughs> yeah, you, li you, like, you like challenges, hard ones, yeah. hard challenges. <laughs> exactly. Tell, tell, me, tell me what is the next uh, step for the startups? Um, basically, the, ne the next stage for a startup is the scale of things, because okay. we created the proof of concept for for a smart farming solution, and now we're working with farming as a service to be another proof of concept and uh, enable us to outsource these units like to as many different clients that we want. And in order for that, we need the maturity of the technology and more financing muscle and more customers, obviously, to come in because we are not a food producer, we are rather an ag tech company that provides you with the solution and enables you to grow food. So that's why we separated our brand of Sui Green, which is the active company from Estas Bundens, which is the produce that we are selling to our customers, to not to be confused with each other. And so people don't look at us as a greenhouse company, which some of our competitors are actually. Uh, and there is nothing wrong about that. But I mean, we are more focused about uh, on the technology. And for me, I guess uh, there is a phase of like maybe somewhat between a year and two that we could reach out that maturity level and from there i haven't really thought it through what should be the next step for me maybe landing on a bigger corporate scene to create an innovation platform or work as a sustainability director for a bigger manufacturer a bigger company could be one step of going 
or maybe continuing with this and taking that to and um, you know basically introduce it to the stock market could be one one yeah. uh, one step for me. I haven't really decided, but it's a dilemma between like should I go and try to get like a bigger challenge because what made me coming to the startup world was that I didn't see myself that much armed and prepared to deal with the bad kind of settings on the corporate scene when okay. it comes to sustainability and innovation. I gave it up, but now I feel more prepared to go down there and you know get a bigger bite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, but do you think that uh, COVID-19 make everything slow for you or for the company, I, I mean? I mean, it's, it's in two different aspects. I mean, production-wise and operation-wise, it actually gave us a better capacity because our market became bigger and people realized that local produce is more safe for them. And it's more important for you to support your local producers. And especially when they don't just back up on you when a crisis hits you. But when it comes to our R&D uh, activities and uh, you know, kind of like collaboration with the other private entities, it's kind of getting more slowed down, actually. So there are like some barriers for that. But I guess like COVID-19 is a kind of like two side sharp sword that came to us and on one side is giving us some really really kind of like sorrowful um you know consequences by seeing like so many elderly people and senior citizens are getting hit by that and so many people are quarantined and people are scared and many people losing their jobs but on the other side we are realizing like how important an existence of a community is for us yeah. and how we have actually treated our ecosystem and whatever our, our surrounding is shaped of in a set that it's now like basically firing back on us. So it's very, um, it's a dilemma again when it comes to that. And I think like the world is going to be so different when this COVID virus basically gets under control or it's just going to vanish. Yes, yes, I totally agree with you. Yesterday I had a podcast also with a doctor from New York Hospital and we talked about oh. the COVID-19 situation and all agrees that it's a big reflection moment and also it's a kind of a wake up sign to all the humans. That, okay, wake up, reflect exactly. about your lifestyle. What are you doing? Mm. What are you doing? Exactly. And I guess it's going to be a world with a human face, I could tell you. I mean, that's my impression, that it's going to be more like humanly shaped when this situation is resolved. Yeah, yeah. For me, too, I think it's going to be we, we, we're we going back to our human being, like less this, uh, how to say, arrogant and aggressive production mm -hmm. and just harming the nature. So, yeah, as you'd say, this both ways. Yeah, yeah. So what is the next step for you as a person? I mean, um, I'm thinking a lot about like reflecting on what makes me more happy and satisfied as you're growing old. Because I mean, these are like these different phases of your life when you just think about like success and like gaining things and like, you know, going up the ladder and so on. And then sometimes you just stop and take a look back and start like realizing what are the things that you compromise what are the things that you lose what are the things that you gain and you start to just create a you know a mental map for yourself like how happy i am how satisfied i am how fulfilled i am as a person so and i guess i'm kind of like in that phase that i'm reflecting a lot on that i mean it started for me around 10 years ago with focusing more on i mean i'm I was more focused on like gaining money and like having a job and status and a good business card and like a fat, you know, salary check and stuff like that. And in a later stage, it made me realize like at what cost and what are the things that you should compromise. And then I kind of like started to become a bit more humble in that sense and like more thoughtful of like how you should think about you as a person and how you should try to just you know focus on your personal happiness but it's not that easy to deal with that as well and find the purpose in your life like what's going to be my legacy after i'm gone from this face of this planet and you know 
So it's it's a lot of like engagement in at the philosophical level, I could tell you. Yes, <laughs> yes. But this is really good because this is also shows in the result when you when you work with your startup as well. Like what values you have and how do you put it as well in your job and how does this go to the society? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Now almost in the last two questions, the the okay. closing of the, the story of this chapter. And the first mm-hmm. one is about the three takeaway messages and the second one is about three hashtags. Can I combine those two together? <laughs> sure, 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 sure. <laughs> okay, because I mean, at the moment I'm thinking a lot about like building our future and our creation of future is always rooted in our past. Like how you should analyze the things that happened in the past and how the trends were shaped up and then look at the future, how it happens. Look at like this pandemic, for example, and the other pandemics that we actually like experienced through our human history that is written down. And we experience that, but we just forget about that like so fast. We have this kind of like goldfish memory that actually gives us the possibility of forgetting about the things that are so bitter for us as as an species and like forget about like how our societies are uplifted by different you know uh, kind of innovation who came to the picture or when you talk about different inventions that came to the picture different kind of like societal settings the philosophical changes in our in our uh, society that shapes our future as well and it always has a root in fast so one thing for me is like always think of think about the future and be patient about that and patient is not waiting for something is like looking with a more thoughtful vision so you could think about like the future in an opener sense so and the hashtag for that could be the future (laughs) And, and i think like um innovation especially when it's combined with a sustainable mindset and a long-term perspective especially when it comes to our financial systems because the financial system is a variable of the way that we think and act as different people when you say like i save my money in different funds that give me the best you know spin-off for example then how do you expect the banking system to function differently when it comes like to treating different companies and the, the innovations coming to the market. So one other takeout from that could be green innovation, maybe. Wow. That is something that I like. And I'm writing a blog on, on Instagram about that, which is called Earth of Billions. <laughs> So that's one thing that I'm doing, and I talk about like uh, different futuristic stuff and uh, you know different issues with sustainability and also like human nature. So that's one thing. And then the the last thing that maybe I want to talk about is at the moment we should be thinking of each other more as a community and a society, support each other, be kinder, and think about like this situation is going to be uplifted and it's going to get uh, again like back to normal and support your local businesses and try to be kind and it's going to be all right i guess wow and the hashtag for this is going to be maybe us <laughs> <laughs> very cool very cool really interesting and i really like the idea also that you're blogging so i would love to put the link as well in the description so people can follow you please please yes Thank you so much for this uh, great hour of inspiration and uh, mind-blowing knowledge. Thank you for the invitation. It's it's a pleasure. It's my it's my pleasure. So hopefully see you in Stockholm when things getting better. Absolutely. It's going to get that and we're going to meet up. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for listening to Urbanistica podcast. Please don't forget to follow on Instagram and also subscribe the YouTube channel. And if you have a story that makes our city smarter, so just contact me. I am Mustafa Sharif. Have a good life.